I do greatly again appreciate all and you all of you taking the time to to join us this evening and I value being able to share and to have the privilege of presenting the different information and the different discoveries and the different revelations that the Most High God has shared with me um, in my study and in my examination of a lot of the ancient manuscripts. And for those that don't know or maybe not are familiar with my work, I've been for a very long time now studying the ancient mythologies, the religions, and especially for the past couple decades, my focus has been on the study and great and thorough examination of the extra biblical manuscripts of which most people are not aware of, knowledgeable upon, or familiar with. And having done that work for so very long now, and having read much of this material, you know, multiple, multiple times, and being familiar with it, I'm able to connect what a lot of people can't see and to piece together truth as it as it can be discovered over the wide range and scope of all of this material are you there congressman I see you, but I'm not able to hear you. I don't know why that is. This is a very strange. Let me uh, send a message that will reschedule. And hopefully get this result for the next I see him I just can't hear him and I'm not positive if he can hear me either let me check the discord chat that one I do have access to um again I uh, you know uh, I apologize this has just been a m major disaster and I, again don't understand why it is because we just had things going but I'm going to go ahead and find a text of which I'd like to present read from share so that you know I can at least present some information to you which will be of interest and of relevance to what we may have talked about um, since we're not able to make connection, but and so I will be ready when we return from the first break. Um, I'll look up a specific something which I think would be of interest. Give me just a few minutes here. We're almost at break anyway. So when we return um, from this break, I will, you know, I'll have something set up and lined up to, to cover. We'll be right back, everyone. And Again, I apologize for...
We are TFR. My faith in destiny is all I need to prevail. Truth Frequency Radio. And in those days, there were giants in the land. And the sons of the angels of God looked upon the daughters of men and found them fair, and took of their wives, and their sons became of old great men of renown. So they have been mixing with us on a genetic level since the time of Enoch and Ezekiel's will. Here on Earth we're intrigued by the sun, moon, and stars And imagine there's got to be planets like ours Some conceive of a face on the surface of Mars So in need of a meaning and purpose we lost That indeed they believe that these might be our gods Or that maybe with time we'll do right and evolve And eventually reach what they seek And then solve all the problems of man But they really don't know that they fall And the works of our hands are but just filthy rags So we travel the lands to dig up our past Time our lapses all right, welcome back, everybody, for second portion. Um, I'm going to read from a text called The Vision of Adaman. And I'm pretty sure it's something that most of you are not familiar with and so it is the the last text of the Great Commission 3 the end time apocalypses and it's um I believe it is like middle century 11th 12th century somewhere around that particular time let me actually look up and see if I can find anything on a wiki or anything that talks about it and then I'll share with you hello Kathy good evening and link and everybody else like I said I'm not able to get into the truth frequency radio chat room right now so the only people that I can speak with and share dialogue with are those in our discord chat okay even looking up this particular text there's nothing uh, to be found to even introduce it to you and so I'm going to have to just let the text uh, speak for itself. And it'll be a, an interesting read and uh, hopefully uh, something that you will get something out of it, you know, that you'll receive some kind of something with regard to it in Revelation and so we'll see as we go and if it's something that um, is too much and something I won't be able to cover in great detail I can always shift to another one and maybe even bring you you know a portion of three different texts but we'll see how it goes with this one and then um Decide from there. It's called the vision of Adam. Noble and wonderful is the Lord of the elements, and great and marvelous are his might and his power. For he calleth to himself in heaven the charitable and merciful, the meek and considerate, but he consigns and casts down to hell the impious and unprofitable host of the children of the curse. Which I think it's interesting here that, you know, for there to be even be mention of the children of the curse, because so many are uh, against 
the my teaching on the serpent having seed having a bloodline and a physical lineage here in this world but you know when you study and read so much of even the extra biblical material you see this theme being repeated over and over and over and so there's no doubt in my mind and I have confirmed this numerous ways that there literally are the children of the curse as it says here and they are the sons of Belial just like Cain who was their progenitor he was of the wicked one for upon the blessed he bestows the hidden treasures and the manifold wages of heaven while he inflicts a diversity of torments in many kinds upon the sons of death. Now there are multitudes of the saints and righteous ones of the Lord of creation and of the apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ unto whom have been revealed the secrets and the mysteries of the heavenly kingdom and the golden wages of the righteous likewise the diverse pains of hell with them that are set in the midst thereof for unto the apostle peter was shown the four-cornered vessel let down from heaven with four cords to it and they with sound as sweet as any music also the apostle paul was caught up to heaven and heard the ineffable words of the angels and the speech of them that dwell in heaven moreover on the day of mary's death all the apostles were brought to look upon the pains and miserable punishments of the unblessed for the lord commanded the angels of the west to open up the earth before the face of the apostles that they might see and consider hell with all its torments even as himself had told them long time before his passion Finally, to Adamnan Uathin, the high scholar of the Western world, were revealed the things which are here recorded. For his soul departed from out of his body on the feast of John the Baptist and was convened to the celestial realm where the heavenly angels are and to hell with its rabble rout for no sooner had the soul issued from out of the body than there appeared to it the angel that had been its guardian while in the flesh and bore it away with him to view firstly the kingdom of heaven so this particular text is like a near death experience you know it was uh, something that this individual adam and um was witness to in that he was taken first to heaven and then to hell and that we see in the testimonies of many individuals that have experienced a similar type of scenario that um it's first off it's very profound for them and that especially if they have gone to hell and know that they were undeserving of eternal life and salvation through christ the change is deep and profound and they utilize the new opportunity to immediately change their ways and hopefully their future outcome 
All right, so continue. Now the first land to which they come is the land of saints. A bright land of fair weather is that country. In it are diverse and wondrous companies clad in cassocks of white linen with hoods of radiant white upon their heads. The saints of the Eastern world from a company apart in the east of the land of saints. The saints of the Western world are to the west of the same land and the saints of the Northern world and of the South in their great concourse are to the South and the North. For everyone that is in the land of the saints may freely listen to the music and may contemplate the vault wherein are the nine classes of heaven after their rank and order. For one spell then the saints keep singing marvelous music in praise of God. For another they are listening to the music of the heavenly host. And for the saints have no other need than to listen to the music that they hear and to contemplate the radiance that they see and to satiate themselves with the fragrance that there is in that land. The wonderful Lord is face to face with them in the southeast and a crystal veil between. To the south is a golden portico and through it they discern the form and adumbration of the people of heaven. No veil, however, nor cloud is between the host of heaven and the host of the saints, but those are ever manifest and present unto these in a place that is over against them. A circle of fire surrounds this place. Yet they all pass in and out, and it does not scathe. Now the twelve apostles and Mary, the pure virgin, form a band apart about the mighty Lord. Next to the apostles are the patriarchs and the prophets and the disciples of Jesus. On the other side are holy virgins at Mary's right hand and with no great space between. Babes and striplings are about them on every side and the bird choirs of the heavenly folk making their minstrelsy. And amid these companies, bands of angels, guardians of the souls, do perpetual suit and service in the royal presence. No man is there in this present life who may describe those assemblies or who may tell of the very manner of them. And the bands and companies which are in the land of saints abide continually in even such great glory as aforesaid until the great parliament of doom when the righteous judge on the day of judgment shall dispose them in their stations and abiding places where they shall contemplate God's countenance with no veil nor shadow between through ages everlasting. But great and vast as are the splendor and the radiance in the land of the saints, even has have been said more vast a thousand times the splendor which is in the region of the heavenly host about the Lord's own throne. This throne is fashioned like unto a canopy chair and beneath it are four columns of precious stone. Though one should have no minstrelsy at all, save the harmonious music of those four columns, yet would he have his fill of melody and delight. 
three stately birds are perched upon that chair in front of the king, their minds intent upon the creator throughout all the ages, for that is their vocation. They celebrate the eight canonical hours, praising and adoring the Lord, and the archangels accompany them for the birds and the archangels lead the music. And then the heavenly host with the saints and the virgins make response. Over the head of the glorious one that sitteth upon the royal throne is a great arch likened to a wrought helmet or a regal diadem. And the eye, which should behold, it would forthwith melt away. Three circles are round about it, separating it from the host. And by no explanation may the nature of them be known. Six thousand thousands in guise of horses and of birds surround the fiery chair which still burns on without end or term. Now to describe the mighty Lord that is upon that throne is not for any unless himself should do so or should so direct the heavenly dignitaries for none could tell of his vehemence and might his glow and splendor, his brightness and loveliness, his liberality and steadfastness, nor of the multitude of his angels and archangels, which chant their song to him. His messengers keep going to and from him ever and anon with brief messages to each assemblage, telling to the one host of his mildness and mercy and to the other of his sternness and harshness. Whoso should stand facing about him east and west, south and north, would behold on each side of him a majestic countenance, seven times as radiant as the sun. No human form thereto with head or foot may be discerned, but a fiery mass burning on forever, while one and all are filled with awe and trembling before him. Heaven and earth are filled full with the light of him and a radiance as of a royal star encircles him. 3,000 different songs are chanted by each several choir about him and sweeter than all the varied music of the world is each individual song. Furthermore, in this wise is the fashion of that city, wherein that throne is set, seven crystal walls of various hue surround it, each wall higher than the wall that is below it. The floor moreover and the lowest base of that city is a fair crystal with the sun's countenance upon it, shot with blue and purple and green and every hue beside. A gentle folk, most mild, most kindly, lacking in no goodly quality, are they that dwell within that city, for none come there and none abide there ever. Save holy youths and pilgrims 
zealous for God. But as for their array and ordinance, hard is it to understand how it's contrived. For none turns back nor side to other, but the unspeakable power of God has set and keeps them face to face in ranks and lofty cornels all round the throne, circling it in brightness and bliss. Their faces all, there is a chancel rail of silver between each two choirs, cunningly wrought upon with red gold and silver and choice rows of precious stones variegated with diverse gems and against that lattice are seats and canopies of carbuncle between every two chief companies are three precious stones softly vocal with sweet melody and the upper house of them are lighted lamps 7,000 angels, as it were, great candles shine and illumine that city round about. 7,000 others in the midst thereof are aflame forever. Throughout the royal city, the men of all the world, if gathered into one place, many as they are, would derive substance enough from the sweet savor of any one of those candles. Now, such of the world's inhabitants as attain not to that city after their life is spent, and to whom a dwelling place therein is allotted after the words of doom shall have been spoken find a restless and unstable habitation until the coming of judgment. On heights and hilltops and in marshy paces, even so fair those hordes and companies with the guardian angel of every soul in their midst, serving and tending them, in the main doorway of the city, there are confronted by a veil of fire and a veil of ice, smiting perpetually one against the other. The noise and dim of those veils, as they clash together, are heard throughout the world. And the seed of Adam, should they hear, that din would be seized thereat with trembling and intolerable dismay. Faint and dazed are the wicked at that din. How be it on the side of the heavenly host, naught is heard of that rude discord, save a very little only, and that sweeter than any music. Awful is that city and wonderful to describe. For a little out of much is that which we have told concerning its various orders and the wonders of it. Seldom indeed may a spirit after it converses and after its converse and cohabitation with the body in slumber and repose, in freedom and luxury, win its way to the throne of the Creator, unguided of the angels. For hard of essay are the seven heavens, nor is any one of them easier than the rest. Six guarded doors confront all those of mortal race who reach the kingdom. There sits a porter 
and a warder of the heavenly host, keeping guard over each door. At the door of that heaven, which is nearest on the hither side, sits the archangel Michael, and with him two youths with iron rods in their laps to scourge and smite. The sinners, as they pass through this, the first grief and torment of the path they have to tread. All right, I think we will pick it up on the other side of break. Um, I hope you're at least finding this of interest. Uh, I know that most of you have never heard of this text and have probably never had a chance to read it. And so at least I could, you know, present something to you that is new and unknown to you. We'll be right back for a second hour. Frequency Radio is your number one. You must unite what has been set aside. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I am your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. And um, we have been spending the last portion. We initially tried to get uh, Congressman Fulton Sheen on with us to speak about the state of the world and current affairs and things that are going down in the Middle East and its connection to scripture and to uh, the blooming of the fig tree and all those different things. But unfortunately, um, for whatever reason, that we weren't able to connect. And so I decided to move on and to present this particular this ancient document called the vision of Adaman. And it is basically um, the experience of this Adaman who was given vision of both heaven and hell. And he describes what he sees, what he experiences, and what he has come to know as far as um, what a lot of people have shared, you know, the individuals like Mary Baxter, who wrote a book on both heaven and hell. And there are numerous individuals that have been blessed in similar manner to be able to describe from their experience the particulars and the details of those two particular spaces and the kind of meaning that they held for the souls that go on in passing. 
And so we're going to continue reading with this particular text. And I hope it blesses your life. And of course, you know, I was totally caught off guard with um, not being able to bring on our guests. But at least, you know, I'm able to present this information. And so continuing. At the door of the next heaven... The archangel Ariel is warder, and with him two youths with fiery scourges in their hands, wherewith they scourge the wicked across the face and eyes. A river of fire, its surface an ever-burning flame, lies before that door. Aber Setus is the angel's name who keeps watch over the river and purges the souls of the righteous and washes them in the stream according to the amount of guilt that cleaves to them until they become pure and shining as is the radiance of the stars. Hard by is a pleasant spring, flowery and fragrant, to cleanse and solace the souls of the righteous, though it annoys and scalds the souls of the guilty, and does away not from them, but it is increase of pain and torment that comes upon them there. Sinners arise from out of it in grief and immeasurable sadness, but the righteous proceed with joy and great delight to the door of the third heaven. Above this, a fiery furnace keeps ever burning its flames, reaching a height of 12,000 cubits. Through it the righteous pass in the twinkling of an eye, but the souls of sinners are baked and scorched therein for 12 years, and then their guardian angel conveys them to the fourth door. About the entrance door of the fourth heaven is a fiery stream like the foregoing. He is surrounded by a wall of fire in breadth 12,000 measured cubits through which the souls of the righteous pass as though it were hot there, as though it were not there, sorry while the souls of the sinful tarry therein amid pain and tribulation. For another twelve years until their guardian angel bears them to the door of the fifth heaven. In that place is a fiery river which is unlike all other rivers, for in the midst of it is a strange kind of whirlpool, wherein the souls of the wicked keep turning round and round. And there they abide for the space of 16 years. The righteous, however, with wind through it straightway, without any hindrance. So soon as the due time cometh for the sinners to be released, there out the angel strikes the water with a rod, hard as through it were of stone, and uplifts the spirits with the end of that rod, and then Michael bears them up to the door of the sixth heaven. But no pain nor torment is meted out to the spirits at that door. 
But there they are illumined with the luster and the brilliancy of precious stones. Then Michael cometh to the angel of the Trinity, and one on either side they ushered the soul into the presence of God. Infinite and beyond all telling is the welcome wherewith the Lord of the heavenly host then received the soul. If he be a pure and righteous soul, if, however, he be an unrighteous and unprofitable soul, harsh and ungentle is the reception of him by the mighty Lord. For he said to the heavenly angels, Take, O heavenly angels, this unprofitable soul and deliver him into the hand of Lucifer that he may plunge him and utterly extinguish him in hell's profound through ages everlasting. Thereupon that wretched soul is parted fearfully, sternly, awfully from the sight of the heavenly kingdom and of God's countenance. Then utters he a groan, heavier than any groan as he comes into the devil's presence. After beholding the bliss of the kingdom of heaven, he is then deprived of the guidance of the archangels in whose company he had come unto heaven. Twelve fiery dragons swallow up every spirit, one after the other. Unfit, oh, sorry, until. Until the lower dragon lands him in the devil's maw. There doth he experience the consummation of all evil in the devil's own presence, all ages. After that, his guardian angel had revealed to Adamant's spirit these visions of the heavenly kingdom and of the first progress of every soul after parting from its body. He brought him to visit the nethermost hell with all its pains and its crosses and its torments. Now the first region whereunto he came was a land burnt black, waste and scorched, but with no punishment at all therein. A glen filled with fire was on the further side of it. Huge the flames of it. Extending beyond the margin on either hand, black its base, red the middle and the upper part. There of Eight serpents were in it with eyes like coals of fire. An enormous bridge spans the glen, reaching from one bank to the other. High the middle of it, but lower its two extremities. Three companies seek to pass over it, but not all succeed. One company finds the bridge to be of an ample width from beginning to end until they win across the fiery glen, safe and sound, fearless and undismayed. The second company, when entering, 
upon it find it narrow at first, but broad afterwards, until they in like manner fare across that same glen after great peril. But for the last company, the bridge is broad at first, but straight and narrow. Thereafter, until they fall from the midst of it into that same perilous glen, into the throats of those eight red hot serpents that have their dwelling place in the glen. Now, the folk to whom that path was easy were the chaste, the penitent, the diligent. They who had zealously borne a bloody testimony to God, the band who found the path narrow at first, but afterwards broad, were they who had hardly been constrained to do God's will, but had afterwards converted their constraint into the willing service of God. They, however, to whom this way was broad at first, but straight thereafter, were sinners who had listened to the precept in God's word. And after having heard, fulfilled them not, Furthermore, vast multitudes abide beyond, feeble and powerless, upon the shore of perpetual pain. In the land of utter darkness, every other hour the pain ebbs away from them, and the next hour it returns upon them again. Now these are they in whom good and evil were equally balanced. And on the day of doom, judgment shall be passed between them, and their good shall quench their evil on that day. And then shall they be brought to the haven in God's own presence through ages everlasting. He is there near to the last named group and monstrous their torment. And this is their plight. They are fettered to fiery columns, a sea of fire about them, up to their chins and about their middle, fiery chains. In the shape of vipers, their faces are aflame with agony. They who are tormented thus are sinners. fratricides, ravagers of God's church, and merciless araniacs who in presence of the relics of the saints had been set over the church's tithes and oblations and had alienated these riches to their private store away from the Lord's guests and the needy ones. Great multitudes there are standing in blackest mire up to their girdles. Short cows of ice are on them without rest or intermission. Through all time, their girdles are perpetually scorching them with alternate cold and heat. Demon hosts surround them with fiery clubs in their hands, stinking, oh, striking them over the head 
though they struggle against them continually. These wretches all have their foreheads to the north and a rough, sharp wind blowing full upon their foreheads. In addition to every other woe, red showers of fire are raining on them every night and every day. And they cannot ward them off. Needs endure them throughout all ages, wailing and making them all moan. Some of them have streams of fire in the hollows of their visages, some fiery nails through their tongues. Others threw their heads from side to side. They who are so punished are thieves and liars. And they who have practiced treachery, reviling robbery and raping, judges of false judgments, and contentious persons. Women who have dealt in poison and spells, reavers and learned men who have practiced heresy. Another great throng is set upon islands in the midst of the fiery sea. About them is a silver wall built of the raiment and the alms which they had bestowed. These are they that have practiced mercy without zeal and have remained in loose living and in the bonds of their sin until the hour of their death. But their alms are a bulwark unto them amid the fiery sea until the judgment and after judgment they shall be brought into the haven of life. Another great multitude is there clad in red and fiery mantles down to their middle. Their trembling and their outcries make themselves heard even unto the firmament. An unspeakable throng of demons is throttling them, holding in leash the white, raw hided, striking hounds which they incite to devour and consume them. Red glowing chains are constantly ablaze about their necks every alternate hour. Now they that are punished in this wise are the regulars who have transgressed their rule and became or become loathers of piety. Also impostors who have deceived and seduce the multitude and have undertaken miracles and wonders which they are not able to perform. Moreover, the children that are tearing the men in orders are they who were committed to them for amendment, but they amended them not neither reprove them for their sins. Thereafter is another vast company. East and west they go. Across the fiery flagstones at war. Sorry, I lost my place. Thereafter is another vast company. East and west they go unresting across the fiery flagstones at war with demon hosts. Innumerably 
showers of red hot arrows rained upon them by the demons. Running, they go on without stop or stay, making for a black lake and a black river that they may quench those arrows therein. A weeping and wailing, truly miserable and piteous, do the sinners make in those waters, for in them they only meet with augmentation of their pain. Now they that are punished thus are cheating artificers, weavers, and merchants, judges that judged falsely, both Jews and others likewise, impious kings, Aranex of lewd and crooked ways, adulterous women, and the panders that destroyed them by their evil practices. All right. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a final segment. I do have just a few more pages remaining. Uh, I should be able to get through the rest of the text in about 10 minutes, and then we will end with discussion, and I'll highlight and bring up um, a, a couple of things in connection to this particular text, because... For those that have studied and read other biblical texts, extra biblical texts, you'll see that this particular vision of Adaman, it falls in line with the witness of the apocalypse of Peter, as well as the vision of Paul, in that both of those texts like this one, elaborate in great detail as to what happens to the souls of the righteous as well as the souls of the wicked following death. And the kind of things that they see experience and encounter in having gone to the place of the righteous as well as the place of the wicked. And, you know, this theme is repeated over and over and over in and by those that have had near-death experiences. And so we'll finish up with the, the vision of what is being revealed here as, you know, their 
the encounters with the devils and the demons that rule over Sheol, the angels of Tartarus, those that have the fiery staves and uh, that meet out punishment to the wicked. I think it is interesting, however, that it does show that, or it speaks about how that the wicked and those that fell short, depending on to what degree, that they are able to find forgiveness after a certain period of time. You know, whether that's true or not, uh, I have no idea, but it sounds interesting. And so let's continue. Impious kings... Aranax of lewd and crooked ways, adulterous women, and the panders that destroyed them by their evil practice. Beyond the land of torment is a fiery wall, seven times more horrible and cruel. It is cruel, is it, than the land of pain? Itself, howbeit no soul dwells therein till judgment, but it is the province of the demons only until the day of judgment. At that time, woe unto him that shall dwell amid those pains in company with the devil's own tribe. Woe unto him that is not ware of that tribe. Woe unto him over whom a vile and savage demon is set in dominion. Woe unto him that shall be hearkening unto the spirits, making moan and complaining unto the Lord. They shall find any remission of their doom. For they get no respite ever, save only for three hours on every Sunday. Woe unto him, unto whom that land shall be for a lasting inheritance, even forever and ever. For this is the nature of it, mountains, caverns, and thorny breaks, plains bare and parched with stagnant serpent-haunted locks, serpent-haunted locks. The soil is rough and sandy, very rugged, ice-bound, broad with horrible abysses, wherein is the devil's constant habitation. and abiding place. Four mighty rivers cross the middle of it, a river of fire, a river of snow, a river of poison, and a river of black, murky water. In these wallow, eager hosts of demons, after making their holiday and their delight in tormenting, the souls. What time the holy companies of the heavenly host are singing the eight hours with harmonious melody, praising the Lord with cheerfulness and great gladness, then do the souls of the wicked utter piteous and weary wailing as they are buffeted unceasingly by the demonic hordes. Such then are the pains and torments which his guardian angel revealed to the spirit of Adaman after his journey towards the heavenly kingdom, after which he was born in the twinkling of an eye through the golden forecourt and through the crystal veil to the land of the saints, where unto...
whereunto he had been brought at first. After his departure from the body, but when he bethought him to rest and tarry in that land, he heard through the fail the angel's voice enjoining him to return again into that body whence he had departed and to rehearse in courts and assemblies and in the great congregation of the laymen and of clerics the rewards of heaven and the pains of hell even as his guardian angel had revealed them unto him. This then was the doctrine that Adam and continually taught to the congregations from that time forth, so long as he remained in life. This too is what he preached in the great assemblies of the men of Ire, wherein the constitution of Adaman was imposed upon the gales, and the women were emancipated by Adaman and by Phenacta Fledak, the king of Ire, and the princes of Ire of one accord. Such too were the tidings which Patrick, son of Calpurnius, at the gospel dawn was ever wont to proclaim to wit the rewards of heaven and the pains of hell to all them that would believe in the Lord through his teaching and would accept his guidance and would accept his guidance of their souls. That too is the doctrine most constantly taught by Peter and Paul and the other apostles likewise to wit the enumeration of the rewards and pains which had been revealed to them in like manner. Remember I told you that the apostle, uh, the apocalypse of Peter and the vision of Paul, both of these texts, which the vision of Paul is one of my most favorites. It, you know, as far as the city of God and the Arcturusian lake where the souls are baptized for entrance into New Jerusalem. All of these things are found in great detail in those two books. And they're confirming witness to this one. Even though this is one that most people have never heard about and never had a chance to read. All right, continue. And so did Sylvester, abbot of Rome, teach Constantine, son of Helen, high king of the world, in the general synod, where he offered Rome to Paul and to Peter. Even so did Fabian, successor of Peter, teach Philip, son of Galdion, the king of Rome, whereby he believed in the Lord, and many thousands besides believed in that hour. For he was the first king of Rome that believed in the Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the last portion. And these are the tidings which Elias declared continually into the souls of the righteous under the tree of life, which is in paradise. So soon as Elias opens his book in order to instruct the spirits, the souls of the righteous in form of bright white birds repair to him from every side. Then he tells them first of the wages of the righteous, the joys and delights of the heavenly realm, and right glad thereat are all the throng. After that, he tells them of the pain and the torments of hell and the woes of doomsday. And easy it is to mark the look of sorrow that is upon his face 
and upon the face of Enoch. And these are the two sorrows of the heavenly kingdom. Then Elias shuts his book, and thereupon the birds make exceeding great lamentation, straining their wings against their bodies till streams of blood issue from them in dismay of the woes of hell and the day of doom. Now seeing that they who make this moan are the saints to whom have been allotted everlasting mansions in the heavenly realm, how much more fitting were it for the men that are yet on earth to ponder, even with tears of blood, upon the judgment day and upon the pains of hell. For at that time will the Lord render due recompense to everyone on earth, that is to say, rewards to the righteous and punishments to the guilty. And at that very time shall the guilty be set in the abyss of everlasting pain, and the book of the word of God shall then be closed under the curse of the judge of doom forever. But the saints and the righteous, the charitable and the merciful shall be born to the right hand of God to a lasting habitation in the kingdom of heaven, there to abide without age or death. This then is the manner of that city, a kingdom without pride or vanity or falsehood or outrage or deceit or pretense or blushing or shame or reproach or insult or envy or arrogance or pestilence or disease or poverty or nakedness, or death, or extinction, or hail, or snow, or wind, or rain, or din, or thunder, or darkness, or clod, a noble, admirable, ethereal realm endowed with the wisdom and radiance and fragrance of a plotentious land wherein is the enjoyment of every excellence. And we have arrived to the end. I um, thoroughly enjoyed the book. I apologize that sometimes uh, I'm trying to, you know, the words and the lines, but. Um, Overall, uh, a very fascinating read, and as I said, it falls in line with some of the other books that are available in the apocalyptic literature, such as um, we have both the Apocalypse of Peter and the Vision of Paul as part of the Great Commission series. I believe they are both found in the Great Commission to which the first two Great Commission books are about the about them going forth two by two to all the parts of the world and doing the work of sharing and taking to the ends of the world the gospel as commissioned them by Christ to do so that the Holy Spirit coming upon them with tongues of fire, that they were imbued with wisdom and discernment and knowledge to take for the, forth the gospel truths to all people everywhere in the world. And then the, the third book, which I guess what I could do and this very last segment is just read you the different books that are part of the Great Commission series. If 
I have the time. Let's see. Just to give you an idea of all that is contained within them. And so let's see. Okay. Let me find the Great Commission one. All right, it just took a minute to load up. Okay, so the Great Commission one, these are the texts that are contained within it. The Acts of Paul and Thecla, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel according to Mary, the Acts of Peter and Paul, the Gospel of Thomas, the Acts of Thomas, the Acts of Thaddeus, the Acts of Andrew, the Acts of Xanthippe and Polyxena, the Acts of John, the Acts of Perpetua and Felicitas, the Acts of Philip, the addition to the Acts of Philip, and the Acts of Barnabas. And also I'd like to remind people that we currently are spending our Saturdays, our tar what used to be our Targum study, reading through different stories in the Great Commission one. And we will be going to the Great Commission two very soon and the Great Commission too is comprised of these books. The Gospel of Nicodemus, the Gospel of Bartholomew, the narrative of Joseph of Arimathea, the doctrine of Adai, the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, the Acts of Barnabas, the martyrdom of Bartholomew, the Acts and Martyrdom of St. Matthew the Apostle. The Vision of Paul, which is the one that I made mention of earlier. The Acts of Andrew and Matthias. The Acts of Peter and Andrew. The Consummation of Thomas the Apostle. The Book of Thomas the Contender. And the Gospel according to Peter. And I'll read you the, the books of the Great Commission 3, the end time apocalypses, which all of these are about the end of days, are being the fig tree generation. And if you read these particular books and these particular texts, you'll come to understand the narrative of the end times in greater capacity than you could have previously. Because, you know, again, most of these books are are not known by most people and not well studied or well read. All right. The End Time Apocalypse, Great Commission 3. The Apocalypse of Abraham, the Apocalypse of Moses, the 14th Vision of Daniel, the Apocalypse of Elijah, the Hebrew Apocalypse of Elijah, the fourth book of Ezra, the Apocalypse of Sidrach, the Sibling Oracles, Book 2, the Apocalypse of Zephaniah, the Apocalypse of Baruch, the Apocalypse of Thomas, the Apocalypse of Peter, the First Apocalypse of James, the Second Apocalypse of James, the Apocalypse of Paul, the Revelation of St. John the Theologian, the Ten Signs of the End of the Age, the Apocalypse of Samuel, the Apocalypse of Zerubbabel, and what I just read from, the Vision of Adaman. And so, you know, for those that are interested in studying, you know, the extra-biblical books, and you really want to know more, you know, like the first two books are an extended book of Acts. And then the um, the third book is like, you know, like 20 different revelations, uh, all from different perspective, different apostles and with different insight. And really studying and reading all of them 
you will come to know more about what the apostles encountered and also what they wrote about as the signs of the end of the age and of the second coming of Christ. And, um, you know, putting them together in parallel study, uh, as I said, you will become more familiar with the end times than most people uh, teaching about the Bible in, in mainstream churches. Because, again, most people have never heard of all these texts and certainly have never studied them. All right. God bless all. Until next